Welcome to the Mies Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Sharkey, the founder and CEO of Mies, a culinary operating system for food professionals. On the show, I'll be interviewing world-class entrepreneurs in the food space that are shifting the paradigm of how we innovate and operate in our industry. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Yo. They say art mirrors life with every stroke of the pencil. I'm giving you folks a glimpse into my experiences you could trace like a stencil. My guest today is chef, entrepreneur, and one of the sweetest guys you'll ever meet, Gabe Kennedy. Named to Forbes 30 Under 30 in 2020, Gabe spent a bunch of time in some really incredible kitchens before becoming executive chef at Bon Appetit, as well as winning Anthony Bourdain's cooking competition show, The Taste, which you might have seen on Netflix. He's the founder of Plant People, a CPG company specializing in natural health foods like adaptogens, and mushrooms, and CBD. And he's also a chef partner of Checker Hall in LA. He's worked with a bunch of really incredible brands like GQ and Espresso and Taiwan Tourism and Botanist Gin, and HBO, and a bunch more to create really delicious food and experiences. Gabe and I got to know each other when we brought him on to consult on a plant-based concept out of New York City, and we became fast friends. I've always loved his really infectious passion for what he does. And as an aside, he's actually a pretty rad musician as well. So we talk about running multiple companies at the same time and why we cook and how to tell your story authentically, among many other wide ranging topics, as usual. So I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the show. Good to see you, man. Yes, yeah, good to see you too. Great to see you. Yeah, we talk sometimes, but it's more text. I don't see your your beautiful face that often, so. Here it is. Yeah. Well, anyways, let's get started, Mr. Cape. Let's get started, Mr. Josh. Sounds great. For all of the food people out there, everybody in the world that might, for some crazy reason, not know who you are, I don't know how they would. <laughs> Do you want to share a little background on, on yourself? Sure. So for most of the people in the world who have no idea who I am, my name is Gabe Kennedy. I am a chef, entrepreneur, co-founder of a business called Plant People. We create functional foods that are rooted in regenerative agriculture and addressing some of the most pressing and challenging solutions that we deal with as humans. I'm also a chef partner in a restaurant in Los Angeles called Checker Hall, and we just have a good time over there. So <laughs> I've spent most of my career in hospitality and food and feel really grateful that I get to engage in the broader food ecosystem in the ways that I do and get to talk to people like you. Yeah. I'll add on to that. You're a, an incredible musician <laughs> and an empath, I would say, one of the most empathetic people I've ever met. You won that show called The Taste a long time ago as well. It's true. Anthony Bourdain. How did you get on that show? Yeah, I don't think we ever talked about like, how did that happen? Well, it was almost a decade ago. Wow. But I was, yeah, I was 23. And a girl that I went to hotel school with, Beth, was working at Major Food Group. And she basically called me up one day and said, I had some casting people hit me up about people within the group that would be good, but I thought of you. So you should apply. And I did. And at the time, I was working as a private chef, but also my real job was working with this organic food group that was invested all across the lifestyles of health and sustainability category, the LOHAS space. And I was just ready for something different. And so I applied kind of on the low. And then when I got the word that I could do it, I quit my jobs. <laughs> I left <laughs> the private equity group and I left the private chef gig and I flew out to LA, stayed at the Westin LAX for what was a very long month. And had this experience that really changed my life. It was, it was pretty awesome. Yeah. Really incredible. And a dream come true because yeah, when I was 14, 13, you know, I started getting interested in working in a restaurant all because I read Anthony Bourdain's like so many kitchen confidential. And so I got my first gig in an Italian restaurant at the age of 14 and worked through high school, predominantly in a sushi restaurant and culinary school, hotel school, and then eventually that show, and eventually here now. Yeah. Well, you crushed it on the show, and Anthony Bourdain had some pretty nice things to say about you. Thanks. Any reflections on interacting with, with him? I'm sure there was a, just a cool experience being on that show, but given the impact and who he is, I'd love to hear any reflections you have on just being able to interact with him on the show. Yeah, it was an incredible opportunity for me. It was a dream come true because of the story I just shared, but obviously I had and still do have so much respect for 
you know, sort of the honest voice that was so and continues to be so unifying. And it was just remarkable to not only be in his presence, but also with Marcus Samuelson, with Luda, with Nigella, all these other talented cooks and put into this pressure chamber of needing to perform and to kind of put my best foot forward. And so, you know, there was a pretty clear line between like judges and contestants for fairness purposes. And so we weren't like, you know, shooting the shit after shooting or anything like that. But I was able to spend some time with him at some fundraisers thereafter, after I'd won and just a really down to earth dude, just a great, easy to talk to down to earth guy, not necessarily the most expressive or open in the public forum, but we just kind of, I, I recall sitting at this table and I was next to him and we were drinking a bottle of, of scotch and I was trying to find words. <laughs> yeah, just kind of hanging out. It was great. But that experience really changed my life because it was the first time in my life I really felt committed to throwing my all into something. I gave it everything that I had every day. And I supported myself physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually throughout the process, which was quite grueling. You know, it was over a month of filming six days a week, 4 a.m. wake ups. And it panned out well for me. That it did. Well, you know, I think there's a lot of those shows and I think now there's probably a lot more talented cooks back then. Maybe it was a mixed bag, but there's definitely an anomaly with you because we work together. So I know this, we're not only entertaining, but an incredible cook as well and have an incredible palate. So thank you. I appreciate that. That was a, a serendipitous opportunity for you for sure. It was. And also thinking about that whole time, I was reflecting on the industry generally because it's like, I'm young, but I'm not that young right? I'm 32 years old. And so I think first off, that was at a moment when social media like really wasn't a thing. So it was pre, you know, Instagram era would have been a lot different if it was, I think as well. And it was also, I was also coming out of a time working in restaurants where the culture was completely different and a month of, of no days off getting into the kitchen at eight, leaving it two, three, four in the morning and doing it again and again and again. I think I was getting paid like $217 a week or something. So I feel like I was able to enter a situation like that with a pretty excited perspective. Like, oh, this is a cakewalk, you know, in comparison to <laughs> grinding it out. So yeah, a lot has changed, especially now being in a position of employing people, both in a CPG business, but also in a restaurant. Like what is expect how we, uh, we work together? What is it like running a CPG company and also running a restaurant? Plant People has been my life for the last six years. So Plant People is my health and wellness company. We make mushroom gummies for focus, sleep, stress, mood, gut health. We also make capsules and some powdered beverages where we sell you know, into Whole Foods Market across the country, vitamin shop, et cetera. Most of our business, however, is direct to consumer. It's been an incredible learning experience to adapt and to weather the storm. I feel like we've gone through a lot. We started in the hemp category that obviously changed um, and kind of crash and burned. And we were able to pivot and ride through COVID and now finally kind of find our footing with really strong product market fit again with these mushroom gummies. And so I think for me, it's really about having a marathon mentality and understanding that there's going to be an ebb and a flow and that there's not necessarily right or wrong decisions. Just making a decision is quite powerful in itself and we'll figure out the next thing. Obviously, we want to make the most informed decisions that we can. What guides those decisions is our core values and principles about trying to take care of people and the planet and make sure we're investing in the right kinds of materials, the right kinds of sourcing opportunities and not compromising on the efficacy and customer outcome of the product, but also making sure that we continue to have the lights on. And so as a company that's rooted in sustainability and sort of obviously this broader quote unquote wellness category, at times it's challenging. Like how do you balance doing all of the best practices with creating a business that is economically sustainable? And it's a really interesting space to operate in. And it's full of learning opportunities for me. 
So I feel like I've grown just leaps and bounds over the last six years. And as far as a leader, as far as a business person, as as far as just a, a human and as a person and, and professional, been a remarkable ride. I think coming out of COVID, really missing the human interaction and working with my hands and being able to inhabit my my hospitality spirit, which and, and my spirit of service, which brings me so much joy. I was yearning for that. And working remote, working on Zoom, working on a computer can be challenging. And I kind of serendipitously had an opportunity to just lightly help my friend out with bringing the food and beverage program of his restaurant and venue back in house. And I was really inspired by him as a person and entrepreneur and was able to kind of help and started off as a light kind of consulting role, if you will, but just really friendly. Like it wasn't anything very formal or engaged. It was like, sure, like I'd love to kind of contribute. And those contributions ended up being pretty meaningful and kind of led to a deeper relationship and further involvement. And so being able to create a physical space and experience for people has given me a deep sense of fulfillment and excitement and also allowed me the space and opportunity to integrate further into this Los Angeles community, which I just moved to. So it's also been a really big blessing. And of course, being able to put my food out there and work with a talented team is always a total blast. And it feels great when it's received well, which knock on wood, it is. Yeah. Well, and as a chef, it's, like, it's hard to go too long without getting your food out there again. I had to get back in there, man. I had to get back in there. I was chomping at the bit. Yeah, I feel you, man. I feel you. And so I think to answer your question really directly is it can be a bit of a challenge, right? I'm fortunate I'm not in the day-to-day ops, like scheduling people or anything like that, right? That would just be far too much. You know, I work 7 a.m. to 3, 4 p.m. on plant people and I try to get some exercise and find ways to have balance. And then a few nights a week, I'm going in, right? To check our hall. But to answer your question, like it's a challenge. I think I've always had a hard time with the work life balance. And I started like cycling and trying to create some activities that take up a good amount of time so that I can really kind of decompress and nurture and nourish myself. And that has allowed me to be able to show up across the board with a clear head and, you know, open mind and be able to actually do the job. Yeah. Well, I want to dig into plant people more, but maybe just because of what you mentioned, let's talk a little bit about, you know, creating that balance and just creating boundaries as an entrepreneur. It's something as a chef, it's sort of done for you in in a way if all you are, you know, is running a restaurant because you have service. It starts at this time and it ends at this time. And you're gonna get in and you're gonna leave. And but you know, with someone like you, it, it's the same for me. When you have a different type of business or you have multiple businesses, you have to sort of create your own structure. Otherwise it's just mayhem and you have to create boundaries otherwise you could be working until 4 a.m every day and get up and do the same thing and there's times when that makes sense there's times when it's just counter to productivity you have a lot of irons in the fire how do you sort of create those boundaries for yourself do you have like rules around like okay i'm when i get up this hour is for me to do x and before i go into checker hall if i have a checker hall day i'm gonna do y before i go in are there things that you sort of set for yourself like that So I have like four things I try to tick off every day, which is movement. So I, it's very important for me to move my body. That usually happens in the afternoon because I start work with plant people quite early, some sort of like meditation or mindfulness activity. I love sitting in front of this red light that I have in the morning and just take 10 minutes to just meditate. Music, really, I got to jam out to some great kind of music or express myself musically throughout the day. And then a meal, I need to have one like totally dedicated. It's not on the go. I'm not just throwing something in my mouth out of a, you know, a quart container or eating a bar on the go, like really sit down and enjoy it. And I find those four things to be really helpful. I do have, you know, a pretty distinct structure and that's seven to mid afternoon, three, 4 PM. Like I'm all hands on deck with plant people. That is like my priority. I live and breathe. It's been six years that I've been on this and we're at a really pivotal moment. And so making sure that I can show up as 
best as I can as a leader and as an operator is critical. We're also a small team, right? So we have to show up. You know, creating that afternoon space for me to go to the gym and or ride bikes or play some tennis is just a delight and I really look forward to it. And then I would say that I actually get a lot of, you know, nourishment out of watching and service happen and standing at the pass and making sure plates are right and serving and doing the things that, you know, you would expect people in our position to be able to do. But, you know, the the boundaries have been something that I admittedly could be better at. Yeah. I work a lot. And like, sometimes I think what I find is that if I'm not working, I feel like, what am I doing? Right. Like what, like that's where I started to be like, well, this is a little scary. The default becomes work as opposed to the default becoming a human being. (laughs) And that's where I was like, okay, I need to make sure that I'm taking like weekends and I'm taking, I'm just taking these times to really sink into not doing anything, which can be really hard to do. I've seen you in the thick of it. How, How have you put structure around it? Well, it's funny you bring it up and we'll get, I was actually opening up about this a little bit today and maybe you and I can get a little vulnerable here too as well. I have the same struggle and I, I'm, you know, 10 years older than you, but I'm still questioning. And I talk to my therapist now about it, just wondering why, why do I always drive? Why, why am I constantly like the default being do more, grow more, add on more. For and sure. there's obviously a benefit to that in some ways as, as an entrepreneur or as just what if you want to be successful and things, but then the other side of the coin is is why. What are you driving towards? Why isn't it okay to stop? And I haven't figured that out, by the way. So that's not like a, this is by no means a life lesson. And it sounds like we're, as entrepreneurs, we all are trying to, if we're questioning these things, wondering why, but it is important. And I think another question I would have for you, and I think about this a lot too, when I'm thinking about something else outside of my business, and I try as best as I can to focus, but let's be honest, like as an entrepreneur, you you're always thinking about more things. How do you context switch when you're moving from plant people to checker hall? And then is there any guilt or any like, oh, I need to be doing more for plant people or, oh, I need to be doing more for checker hall when you're sort of, you know, switching between the two? So first thing I would say is that I completely agree with you. (laughs) I question, I'm like, what is all this for ultimately? What am I looking for here? I would say that the second piece is I went and I took a long vacation around the beginning of the year. I took like two full weeks. I didn't open my computer once. I didn't do like any work stuff. And I went to Japan, which was like a lifelong dream of mine. And I found myself for a variety of reasons in relation to this conversation, found myself very moved and very emotional because I felt like for the first time in a really long time, I was really living. I was completely present and immersed in my surroundings and my partner and myself and my smell and sight and taste. And it was just like truly living. And it was so beautiful and so nourishing and so restorative. And also, in the same breath, a little bit sad for me to be like, whoa, like this feels like life. Like how do I tap into this a daily, a weekly basis? Because this feels so good. So I've tried to, you know, work with my therapist, right? To like figure out why was that and how do I bring it into my daily experience? Because that's the kind of life that I want to live and living completely, you know, technology free in a foreign country for many, many years on end is maybe not the most realistic thing for me at at this moment, but it was very special. So that was one thing that came up just kind of in response. I think as far as like the balance and the guilt, I don't really feel guilty because I do have an order of priority and I do dedicate my work hours and beyond to this project, Plant People, that has been a part of my life for the last six years. And as I said, is in a really important moment to push over the finish line. I also recognize that like without these other experiences, which are a big part of me, I would not be able to show up in the same way. And so one thing really pays my bills, which is plant people, right? And like that is my priority. 
But this other thing is like so deeply exciting for me and like lights my fire and really gets me stoked. So it's important for me to be able to engage in that. And I spent the last six years, I mean, if I'm being super honest, like six years, like really just putting the business before myself every day. And now like after six years, I'm like kind of poking my head out and being like, okay, what do I as Gabe, an entire person need to do for, for myself, for my person, for my profession, for the things that I'm passionate about. And quite frankly, like for my future. Yeah. So what can I do? And I'm doing my best to be able to balance all of those things. And I think it comes down to communication, you know, and I feel really fortunate to have two great partners and friends within this who are really very near and dear to me. And the primary principle is just open communication. We've gone through a lot together and there's been times where it's like, hey, I need you to show up more or, hey, I'm going to need more from you. And that goes both ways and being able to integrate that feedback, listen to it and move forward from it, knowing that we're in this for the long haul together is key. Yeah. So the trust and communication has been like the buoy to allow these things to happen. Yeah. And standing expectation. It's great that you don't have that go because you, because you shouldn't and it's, it's not healthy. And I think about that because it just makes you better. And those things we need to be rounding out so that, you know, when you're spending time away, it doesn't mean that that's not still a creative to plant people because you're bettering yourself and you're improving other parts of your brain or your life or your happiness. It's funny that like, I think we're similar in this, that the thing that you, a respite for you from running this business is, is running another one. Yeah. But that's, that's just sort of I know. Our world. I, I, my wife always gives me a hard time. The things that I love to do seem like work to most people, but I think it's just part of, of what we do. Yeah. And also, like, I, I will say, like, cycling has also been this huge thing that has been additive to my life and where it's like it gives me time and space to think and disconnect and to explore and have kind of that sense of adventure that I found so exciting in Japan. And so I've been like doing that with a few dear friends and it's been another kind of like, kind of pillar to my daily experience that has just rised all yeah you know risen all ships but but yeah i mean look there is inherently a little bit of guilt in all of these things because i am a firm believer that you can't spread yourself too thin and so that's like the danger right like if i am spreading myself too thin and then the performance in any of these arenas like starts to decline then that's where the you know looking in the mirror and being okay how to kind of change this yes yeah. that's not serving anyone well no, but it definitely sounds like you're being smart about it. I'm trying my best. You see, uh, somehow Elon Musk has <laughs> three, yeah. company, three, four companies yeah. that are all like, what you know, massive. <laughs> That's hysterical. That's that'll be my rebuttal. If, if Elon Musk can do it, it yeah. <laughs> I mean, if Josh Sharkey can do it, yeah, right. We were talking about that drive, right? And like, why do we have this drive? The more that I think about it. I'm not sure yet. I'm still sort of trying to find out, at least for myself, but I think a lot of it is actually maybe not even necessarily drive, but this sort of level of creativity if you're a creative. Like for me, like even if I'm on vacation or if I'm reading a book or if I'm on a run, I'm almost always thinking about something related to growing and improving. And I don't know if that's healthy either, right? Like, so when we we're like, you're talking about being in Japan and you're sitting there, you're having this delicious meal. How much of when you're eating that is like, oh, that way that they glaze that is such a great idea. I need to index that in my brain. Or is it just, when can we just say, let completely let go mm -hmm. and just enjoy it and not think about yeah. how it applies to, I don't, I don't know if that's something that, that you think about or, or struggle with, but I constantly am trying to find ways to, as, as best as I can to to find some space. It sounds like you have maybe with cycling where I, I'm not thinking about work and growing and improving or, or improving some or solving some problem. We probably are still solving the problem subliminally by stepping away and giving ourselves space. But I'm curious how you how you think about that. Yeah. Well I always had a little notepad. <laughs> yeah, so see. when I was eating, I was like, there's notepad. Yeah. yeah, I think if I'm cycling, I'm like just trying to keep up with these people. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, like just make it up this hill. Just make it up this hill puts me very much into the present. I'm very much like a self-improver. I mean, I think you and I have a lot of similarities. I remember when we were working together, you were beginning your ketosis journey. Oh, yeah. And it's kind of just this like biohacking kind of how can I improve? I, I constantly playing with like, what am I going to eat? Like, what, 
is gluten good for me? And should I try being vegetarian? Should, should I just go a little more keto? Like I'm always kind of tinkering. I'm just a tinker in that way. So it can be hard to kind of disconnect, but I kind of go back to that, a study tip and hack that I learned when I was really young, which was like, if you're trying to memorize something, do dedicated, you know, 10 minutes of really trying to memorize how to spell this word or whatever. And then you like walk away, get a drink of the water fountain and come back to it. And usually it's there. So I do think that that space is, is healthy and important and ultimately very productive. It requires letting go. Yeah. Which is not easy for people that are constantly trying to improve. Well, sometimes it's like, okay, well, what am I doing this for? (laughs) Yeah. Like, uh, does it, does literally any of this matter? Probably not. If you start going down some rabbit holes of, of like yeah. how far away galaxies and how there's probably a thousand or a billion or an infinite numbers of Earths, you definitely start to question that. This podcast is brought to you by Mies, the culinary operating system for food professionals. As a chef and restaurant owner for the past 20 years, I was frustrated that the only technology that we had in the kitchen was financial or inventory software. Those are important, but they don't address the actual process of cooking, training, collaboration, and consistent execution. So I decided if it didn't exist, I'd do my best to get it built. So the current and next generation of culinary pros have a digital tool dedicated to their craft. If you're a chef, mixologist, operator, or generally if you manage recipes intended for professional kitchens, Mies is built just for you. Organize, share, prep, and scale your recipes like never before and get laser accurate food costs and nutrition analysis faster than you could imagine. Learn more at www.getmes.com. We were talking about health and sort of digging into like what, what should you be keto, should you be paleo? But maybe we can sort of get back a little bit to what you're doing with plant people. And a lot of what it is has to do with mushrooms, adaptogens. Can you maybe just for anybody that doesn't know, like talk about what adaptogen, Sure. how you're sort of using those in your product. With plant people, we create like regenerative solution-based products. And so every product is doctor formulated and anything edible is you know, chef crafted by, by nature of me, but they all drive towards addressing some of the more challenging issues that we have, whether it's sleep or stress, mood, gut health, energy focus, et cetera. Really our mission is to continue to look back and look forward around the treasure chest, if you will, of opportunity that nature has to support us. And that may be adaptogens, nootropics, it may be pre and probiotics, you kind of you name it. Adaptogens being a buzzword at the moment, truly do adapt to what your body's needs are. There's a specific definition, which is they're non-toxic, non-specific and normalizing. I think there's maybe a few other attributes, but generally you can consume them in high quantities and they're safe. They are not specific to any one particular function, work across the body and work to normalize or you know bring your your body back to homeostasis. In the most sort of common application and what people talk about is for you know stress and mood and helping regulate our cortisol response, which is our stress hormone. And so over time you see the benefit of these compounds whether it's rhodiola or ashwagandha or reishi or lion's mane, et cetera, begin to kind of build and compound. And we are able to manage life with a little bit more ease and a little bit less reactivity, emotional response. We also like to lean into nootropics, which are different plants or herbs. We're much more in like the natural world. So hence our name plant people, we're not, you know, dropping in crazy compounds, but more mushrooms and herbs. Nootropics to support cognition and brain health. And we also include some nutraceuticals for a more immediate effect, if that if that makes sense. So the foundation of the product is how can we deliver an immediate effect to help you sleep better or have more energy focus or be less stressed? How do we create a product that you can continue to utilize that is only going to get better over time? And then hopefully, right, your one is able to re- reestablish the relationship with that challenge. So, wow, now I have a new relationship to sleep. I don't have to necessarily keep taking these. Perhaps I can sort of do it on my own now. So we sort of see our products as tools to getting back to, you know, your true self and and where you want to be. Of course, I would love for you to purchase them well into the future, but 
if we can empower you or others or ourselves to have ownership over our own health and agency around how we can engage with it, then that's a win. Yeah. I think I texted you a while back because I was, I've been taking ashwagandha for a very long time, or at least I was, I was taking a lot, <laughs> maybe more than I realized I yeah. should have been, like 1200 milligrams a day for like seven months. And it helped. And then I stopped taking it and holy shit, I didn't, you never know until you stop it. Like there's like this ashwagandha withdrawal. What was that like? It was rough, man. I felt like for a day, literally, like I was like going through psychosis. I was like, oh my God, really depressed. And for no more than a day, like four days. I was like, what is going on? And then I finally started doing some research. I was like, oh, got it. Yeah, I stopped. <laughs> I stopped out of Ghana. That's what I texted you about. Wow. No, I remember that. What else to use? And you know, these things work. Yeah. I'm curious also, because my wife uses the mushroom gummies, the, the plant people mushroom gummies. But you, know, you started in CBD back when every other company was going to be a CBD company and you were pretty smart to you know, how to pivot. But I think that psilocybin is starting to become, you know, more prevalent, less like at least decriminalized now, starting to be legalized. Is that something that you're thinking about as a product at some point, the use of psilocybin or other psychedelics as a way to, to you know, to help with mood? Or- I definitely think that there's a time and place, right? So I think we established plant people at, with this idea that we wanted to drive towards solutions. And CBD was a, an ingredient at the time that had, and still does, I think have a lot of relevant, it's very relevant for people dealing with particular things. I don't think it's the be all end all. Hence why we named our company plant people, not CBD people, right? We want to be a legacy brand that can exist well into the future and explore this broader ecosystem. We were pretty early. We were able to definitely grow the business through the early days of the CBD kind of boom, so to speak, but then continue to evolve out. Right now, mushrooms, I think, is going to have a similar trajectory. I hope that it doesn't get oversaturated, but it does feel like every day there's a new mushroom company coming out. The psychedelic component is very exciting and I think very helpful for people. Unfortunately, for a business like us, it's Illicit. And so, you know, it, we, we could never kind of dabble in that category and also be in a retailer like Whole Foods or Vitamin Shop. I do think that if there is a time and place with the right kind of partnerships, who knows how far into the future, right? Perhaps we are like known as the mushroom gummy people and there could be a natural evolution into that. But it's a pretty sticky area to get into as an above board business. I do know a lot of people who are in that business and they're doing very, very well, very, very well because it's all cash too. I want to just preface for a minute that like my wife still takes CBD from the plant people. It's not CBD oil anymore. Specifically, I think it's called like, there's like a sleep drop kind of uh, yeah. that you guys have. Uh, and that CBD works great for sleeping. Yeah. Um, and mind you, we were always and always have been blending other ingredients. And so- that particular product is not just CBD, it's also CBN and there's, you know, botanical terpenes and all these different kind of research backed elements that drive towards a delightful outcome for whoever chooses to take it. I'm glad she takes it. I'll send you some. Oh, thank you. I'll, I'll let her know. Yeah, pleasure. <laughs> pleasure. It's on me, Hannah. It's on me. Yeah, all right. I got some points today. Let me ask you, good feel free to pass, by the way. Uh, if tomorrow psilocybin was legal everywhere, sure, would you be selling psilocybin? That's a great question. I mean, I would certainly be interested. I'd have to consult with my other half of the of the business to see what his perspective is before making any kind of decision. But the truth is, what kind of roadmap would that lead to, right? Because we've been in this for six years. And at some point, it's like, okay, do we keep on operating as is? Do we align with another strategic entity? Do or Is there an acquisition? Is there a big fundraise that puts us into a VC cycle, like thinking through the long-term trajectory and any implications. But if it was completely legal, then perhaps it's, it wouldn't really impact the trajectory in any which way. Yeah. But I find it to be interesting. I've dabbled quite a bit yeah. you know, throughout my, yeah. my life with, with psilocybin and uh, yeah, it, mostly in the microdosing world, but mm-hmm. um, it has a really profound effect if you use it the right way. So it's interesting because I too have, and I've actually had mixed experiences. Like I, at a very early age, was interested in psychedelics and I read some books by Carlos Castaneda 
you know, way of the Don Juan. And like, I really see the importance and ritual around psychedelics and as learning tools, tools for our self growth and evolution. I have not had great experiences when microdosing. And I don't know if that is because I am not a, not a depressive person. And so maybe it's just like, I don't need it, but I've actually had experiences where it hasn't served me very well. Yeah. So I do think there's a lot of excitement around it, but I'm a little bit more in the camp of like, I want to do this for like, go in with intentions and kind of exist and experience it and then work on integrating those things. But the daily or three on, two off, two on three, whatever the kind of format is. Yeah. Just a little. I'm sure it has different effects on everybody. I'm sure probably is, it probably is pretty in- invasive for other people. So yeah, exactly. So anyways, it's interesting because I know it's like kind of all the rage, right? I'm happy it works for a lot of people, but I, I've yeah. had just many different experiences with it. Well, why don't we shift track for a minute? Because on top of being a chef and running a really successful CPG company and all those other things we mentioned earlier. <laughs> Should be my hype, man. You have quite a way with media. I think you you fully grew up with it either, but you know, you work with a lot of food brands and other brands now, and it's a big part of what you do. So outside of just you know, running a company and, and, and being a chef, you're working with a lot of brands. And, you know, this is something that I think a lot of chefs in particular are finding more opportunities with. And I'd love to maybe just like dig in for a minute about how you found success in that. What what's worked for you? Any advice for chefs that are trying to work with brands that's worked for you? Thank you for the compliment. But it's very interesting because at first there was a definitely a bit of a, a stigma, I think coming from like this older mess, whatever, you know what I mean? This a while ago, right? The mentality, especially within like the culinary world, is like you work your way up and you work in restaurants and like run a station, you become a sous chef. You like put in the work, you put in the hours and like any kind of shortcuts or like entrepreneurial skips is maybe not necessarily embraced. It took a lot for me to kind of like not listen to that. And I have always really looked at my life as like, what gets me excited? What do I feel is a calculated risk or opportunity that I'm willing to like, it has to be exciting enough and interesting enough and kind of big enough for me to like take that leap. You know, I leapt into, you know, plant people. I, well, I leapt into that show. I kind of fell into the media thing for a variety of reasons. I enjoy creation. So I'm, I, I would fancy myself a pretty creative person. And I think like making videos has always been a bit of a creative outlet when there was an opportunity for people or when people were coming to me and saying, Hey, like I would like to professionally engage you in this. It also became a pretty great way to subsidize underpaying myself as an entrepreneur. And so feeling pretty fortunate that, okay, I get to do this as a creative outlet, but also it allows me to do this other thing that I also really love. And so I am grateful for that. I think that the advice that I would have, I really don't like the whole like influencer word because if people consider me an influencer, I'm like, oh man, I find that offensive (laughs) because I really have tried my whole life to like create things of value and like do and build things that are just outside of myself. I happen to be in a position where, you know, now people want to hear from me and that's opened up these opportunities. But I think that for me, the key is trying to just do something that's really cool and that people want to hear about and people want to be kind of involved in. As far as like the content itself, making it digestible and beautiful and informative or funny, you know, just entertainment is kind of the key to it. And something I have to consistently remind myself is that it doesn't have to be perfect, that you just kind of got to do it and not spend too long on it. Otherwise it's going to be, you know, you can't, you'll never finish it. I mean, I've seen your videos. Do you have like someone that helps you like take those videos or just using a stand? Honestly, I have my iPhone and I have like a bowl or like for the longest time, I literally, I'd like put my iPhone like in a cup and put it just so it would angle to my cutting board. And I'd Mm -hmm. do like a few things. I learned how to use Premiere, the editing software. And yeah, I would just kind of 
cook something and film myself doing it and then try to instead of watching tv at night or a show like just kind of sit on my computer and try to figure out how i could edit something or like is there a style that resonated with me okay i can try to mimic that or is there something that now i want to do a little bit different okay i'll I'll, I'll mimic that Uh, or i'll try to just create that usually it's pretty piecemeal like it'd be a funny kind of behind the scenes thing because literally i had my phone in a bowl and i had a a flaky salt container like wedged to hold it from slipping that's so funny you would never think that you never know videos. i would love for someone to just do it to help me do it because that's a, that's been the hurdle to actually like really creating things it's a big time investment you know not only are you shopping you're cooking you're filming you're cleaning it's a little bit messier for me when i'm doing that because i'm kind of just like there's other things that are going on and then once you're done you got to sit down at the computer and upload it and make sure the files it's a whole thing so how long does a one minute video take you to oh i could not even tell you yeah it can be really fast or it could be a long time it's so hard to say i wish i knew i should punch the clock so it sounds like the advice you have is just just start doing it just start doing it just get out there you know yeah. don't be afraid how do you negotiate pricing now for with these brands I have someone who does that for me. I don't feel comfortable doing that. That would be like way too much of a time. So that was the other thing, right? Like if this is going to be any part of my life, it needs to be relatively streamlined. I am not a full-time content creator. So having someone who's going to be like supportive and just make sure that it's fair and it makes sense and look at the things and make sure that it's all well and good and let me know, and then I can go and do it. That's great. But it's also awkward and uncomfortable to be like, yeah, yeah, it's not. A- can I get a little bit more? And they're like, well, you know, it's just weird. Well, you know, it's funny you say like, you know, when you started this, I remember, you know, first met you and you, you were you were doing some of this. I think there was that sort of notion from some of the chef community, like, oh, it's selling out to be doing that. But Sell I, think out. It, I think it's yeah, like I whatever. Yeah. It typically comes from a place of insecurity, I think, or fear or why don't I have that? Even though that's not what, mm-hmm. they're, what they're saying. Because I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, well, that's awesome. We can actually leverage our talent and our skill set to generate income. For sure. Why are we not doing that more? And we're probably getting underpaid. You're probably still getting underpaid for what, for what you're doing. But yeah, finally. Yeah. We get paid nothing as chefs. And you know, you- exactly. And also, why not as someone who's actually educate i mean that's been my thing right like i want to demonstrate expertise i want to like share the knowledge that i have we as chefs and there are many people who just know abundantly more than i do why not share that and leverage it as opposed to <laughs> letting someone and here's the challenge that i have is that there's people who can just be chilling at home all day make a video and those were that was kind of like the first wave right there was like people who actually had no idea what they were doing it probably didn't taste good probably didn't Maybe it looked pretty, but there was no actual technique or it it maybe took them a whole day to make this thing. I think that still happens. It definitely still happens. Why not be able to like kind of showcase and share the expertise and professionalism that you as a chef have in habits? So I think why not, right? But it was interesting because I worked at Bon Appetit on like the publishing side and it was kind of like the early days. I I did a very early like branded video. It's like one of the first kind of like brand integration videos with this series cook like a pro. And then I just start like after that, I started to just see it like take off. Not necessarily for me, actually. It didn't take off for me. It took off for others. But, you know, I think being an entrepreneur is like looking at what are the opportunities? What are people consuming? How are people consuming? And whether that's what you, we decide to put on a menu or what kind of opportunity we choose to dive into the data tells the truth. So that was, in fact, I'm kind of jumping around, but how like the mushroom gummies came about. It was, what are people wanting to consume, which is mushrooms, and how are people consuming, which is through edibles or eating delicious little treats as opposed to taking a capsule? Why is no one doing that with mushrooms? And so we were like one of the first, if not the first person to kind of blend those two, that structure with that ingredient functionality. And it was like, yeah, just took off. So I think that just is like the lesson I've learned across my career. I'm just looking for like, where's the momentum? Like, where's the opportunity? How do I incorporate like my set of beliefs and values and things that I find to be important and kind of essential 
into those things. Yeah. To like tease out a lot of what you just said, I think it's really analogous, like what you talked about creating videos online, what you started with plant people and taste. I think, you know, being, you know, an entrepreneur, it's very analogous to just any sort of venture you want to start. I think what always happens is like, well, you worked in some great kitchens, but you didn't do it for 15 years, right? So it's yeah. very easy no, to say, not. it's very easy to say, well, there's somebody that knows more than me that should be doing this or somebody's already doing this. At, at every business that someone questions like, well, somebody's already got, probably has gummies. And I think that you talked before about just make a decision and having a bias towards action. And I think that's the biggest unlock anybody can have if you're going to grow or if you want to be, become an entrepreneur is yeah, somebody might be doing it. Somebody might have more experience than you, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. For sure. And if you keep doing it and iterating and getting better, then you're going to be great. You'll be great comparative to you and you might be better than some, but at the very least, you'll be the best version of you and you just do it. It's funny. I was asking you like, how do you get into working with food brands and how do you sort of create these videos? And your answer is so like refreshing because it's like, Dude, I just did it. <laughs> I didn't have like a videographer. Yeah, I just try it. I didn't have money. I had what I knew about food and I just went and did it. And I think that's the lesson from this is like, especially for chefs, because there's so many of us and there's so many, you always find someone who's a better cook who can can touch the, find the cuisson better than you can or, or but we all have our skill set in any industry and yeah, you just got to get out there and just do it. Yeah. This episode brought to you by Nike. Just do it. <laughs> i agree i mean very well said and for me too it's a little bit of like i gotta detach the ego i gotta just like who cares i may try something and it just is really bad and like that's okay people may not like it and that's okay that's fine i don't need to have multiple michelin stars i don't need to you know have a million followers or this or that or whatever like is it something that i enjoy doing yeah does it scratch my itch? Yeah. Is it additive to my life? Absolutely. So, all right, let's let it ride. Well, I love seeing you keep growing in your career and everything that you do, man. It's inspiring. And likewise, you know, I, I, I think about the age you are now is the age that I was when you were on the taste and seeing how you continue to sort of grow and in, in your career is it's really inspiring. And I hope everybody can take that same approach. So I appreciate knowing you and getting you getting to see all the things that you're doing. I appreciate you as well. I feel like you are one of the most, first off, thank you so much. That really means a lot, especially coming from you, because I really feel like you are one of the most talented, well-rounded individuals that like I've ever met. Your ability to be a great friend and partner and family person and cook and chef and operator and entrepreneur and technology innovator and still throw a crazy dinner party is just astounding. So I really admire everything that you continue to do. And I feel grateful that you invited me on this <laughs> to be in the company of such amazing chefs. You know, it's cool. It was a warm and fuzzy show today. This was a warm and warm and fuzzy one. We're wrapping up here. Appreciate you. Uh, even know you had a three to four hour dentist appointment today. Still, I know, dude. My tooth is killing me. <laughs> I can only imagine, man. But you, crazy. You still like came on with it in the back. So, anything else you want to share with? Uh, this is a lot of chefs. I'm guessing, right? This is a new podcast, but I'm assuming it's a probably a lot of chefs, restaurant owners, food tech people, or just people in the food industry, among others, people that love food. Anything else you want to share with, with the audience? Sure. Well, thanks so much for listening. If there's anything that you want to do, chat about, connect, collaborate, create, answer questions. If I can be helpful, let me know. But I would love to send you some some gummies, love to have you in for a meal, see what happens, and just appreciate being able to, you know, continue to build community. Yeah, man. Well So I'm here. I'm here for it. To everybody out there that plantpeople.com, right? Dot co? Uh, dot co. Yeah. Com sends you to an Irish florist, but co. Plantpeople.co. And then if you're in <laughs> LA, go to Checker Hall. And you can also just DM Gabe and ask him to hang out. And <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah. Well, it was a pleasure. And I hope I get out to LA and see you soon. I can't wait. Take care, man. Thanks for tuning into the Mies Podcast. 
The music from the show is a remix of the song Art Mirror by an old friend, hip hop artist, Fresh Daily. For show notes and more, visit getmes.com forward slash podcast. That's G E T M E Z dot com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love it if you can share it with your fellow entrepreneurs and culinary pros and give us a five star rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. Keep innovating, don't settle, make today a little better than yesterday, and remember, it's impossible for us to learn what we think we already know. See you next time.